working hard to achieve four goals at the same time. The first is to make the very best biochar. The second is to use as much of the process energy as possible. The third is to eliminate as many emissions as possible. And the fourth is to make the whole process as profitable as possible for everyone. we put in, we get out carbon. This is how we really mean to take a bite out of our carbon footprint. Good stuff. So everything on this system gets run by temperatures. We've got thermocouples in a number of places and we know what's going on inside these black boxes by watching the numbers here and interpreting those. This being the, the gasifier is actually right here. What we're doing here is taking wood chips and we're turning those wood chips into wood gas, which is what you actually do in any fire, except that we're separating the process of making gas and burning the gas. Most of the time in a regular fire, you're actually making wood gas and burning it right there next to the log or whatever you're burning. We're making the gas so that we can control it. We're burning it in a combustion chamber. So this whole system runs on wood gas. And we've got two sources for that wood gas. We've got this for the first source to get us started. And then once these get warmed up and start producing gas, we run it through the condenser and bring it back, pump it into the combustion chamber. So we run retort gas or gasifier gas, both of which are wood gas. Some people want to call it syngas. There's a lot of different definitions. It's hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane. There's some alcohols in there. There's all sorts of other stuff that's in that gas. And you get it hot enough, and you mix it with the right amount of oxygen, which is what we're working real hard to do here. And then you get a pretty substantial flame. thing that we're concerned with because we want to get as much energy into the retort as fast as we can without burning it. It's a very um, high alloy stainless steel, very expensive stuff that we're running that heat through and if you burn a hole in it I get very upset but I have done it. I put a two-foot hole through the bottom of one of the retorts one day because I, I got it too hot. But how are you going to learn where the limits are until you go over them, right? Expensive mistake. Uh, Read out there. Can you tell us what uh, what those are telling you? Uh, Johnny will yeah. interpret for me. Okay, so this is obviously that's the temperature of the flu. This is the front heat channel right there that you can see. The and then you can switch it so we can tell, see what the temperature is in the rear heat channel as well. And that, these are for Bell, and that's that's inside Bell's retort. And then this side is for Ariel, and that's inside Ariel. Okay, if we were going to run Bell right now, which is the middle one that Abraham's standing next yeah. to, set the what's Bell temperature. That's the inside of Bell. 
right now. Yeah, right now she's at ambient temperature. Thank you. Right now it's at 500 degrees at that point right there on the other side of this piece of pipe. Now over here. gets to 1350 degrees Fahrenheit we'll, we'll slow it down and control it right there and run the whole system by keeping it right at that temperature it gets up to about 1600 I'll melt a hole in the bottom if I run it at 1200 it takes too long so and this is only by learning over a period of time where the limits are we want to do it as fast and efficiently as we can. And then coming off of the back channel is what? Right now the back channel is 246. So, that so we just started heating that thing up. It's going in at 1100 degrees. This is underneath that retort. It's coming out, it's still only 300. We're 230 right now. When it gets running more efficiently, that one will now rise up to the back channel will be closer to the front channel. Now we know where we've got the whole base nice and hot. And what's left over will go into the heat exchanger. So we've used the heat once. There's still a lot of heat left. Then we catch it in the heat exchanger. And by the time it goes out the chimney, there shouldn't be much left. But you've also done done everything. Yeah, we like to play. Do experiments. All in the name of science, right? Uh, yeah. Dan, you want to tell us about your stoplight? <laughs> <laughs> We're over here laughing because you guys keep flipping that uh, slider switch back and forth. You're going to set the alarm on. Oh. <laughs> we do have alarms on it. It's our first stage of automation. I was driving the. What chips need to be? Uh, as dry as we can get. Um, once you've got this, once you've got this going, they don't have to be dry at all. But you've got to start. A gasifier is sort of a an upside down fire. Okay, mm -hmm. where you're you're heating it at the bottom and making it volatilize, turn into gas, and then we push it down back through the coals, which helps refine that gas. And then when it blows down in there, we add more air so that it turns into a flame. Okay, so in that process, you're making a bed of coals that's right about in here. So once we've had this running, uh, we've got this nice bed of coals in here. And you can just open that and light those coals and close it and turn on the air and it takes off. If you're starting with green wood, if you had to clean out the grates and all of that, we just maintain it or whatever. And you're starting with brand new wood. It's actually better to, we'll take some old char and put it in the bottom and start with that. Otherwise, we're making more gas than, than you can burn and it's too cold. And we'll start throwing smoke up the chimney if we do that. So, um, but to answer your question, once you've got that layer of char in there, you can use wet wood chips, perfectly green, 50% moisture. It will still give you a clean burn in the bottom. There's actually what they call a water gas reaction, which is it's fascinating stuff when you get down into the, the details of it. But you're pushing uh, water through the coals, and if the coals are hot, you've got carbon, you push an H2O into it, it'll break the H2O into H2, and it'll take the O, and combine with the carbon and give you CO. So now you've got H2 and CO, both of which are beautiful fuel gas. You can run a car on it. You can run a generator like we've got back there on it at that point. 
So that's what you basically. Wet wood would actually create more fuel. No. More gas. It's going to give you different gas. The point is the water doesn't stop the reaction. It doesn't put it out. It contributes to it. Um, it that's, that water gas reaction is actually endothermic. So it's, it takes some of the energy out of the coal to do that. But it still turns it into burnable gas. Clean burning is what I'm after there. There's four goals that we're working on here. They're posted on the wall in there. We're going to make the very best biochar that we can make. Goal number one. Goal number two, we're going to use the energy of the process as best we can. There's a reason why that's second and not first. If we're going for energy first, it makes no sense to save the char. <laughs> if you want to make energy, the char is a beautiful, clean burning way to make energy. Okay, so we're after biochar first. Energy comes second. It's still important because we've got so much of it left over, we want to do something with it. Number three is to do it clean, environmentally clean. Our stacks, when this thing is running full bore, you can't even tell it's running. You can drive up and I can't tell it's running from a distance unless I look real hard and you can see some heat ripples coming off of things. But, I mean, even at, what we just have 1300 degrees right there, two inches inside my hand, this is still pretty good on the outside. And that's because of the insulation we're using. That insulation is um, alumina silicate. It's a, it's a ceramic fiber. It's the same sort of stuff they use on the bottom of the space shuttles to keep them insulated from the heat. Um, lots of other fascinating details, things to learn about wood and how it reacts when you heat it up. Goal number four is to make it profitable. If it doesn't make money or serve the, serve the farm somehow, we're not going to keep doing it. As much as we love the environmental benefits of it, which are huge, we all got to make a living. How many people are going to have a hobby this size, you know, just in order to save some CO2? So, Bob, how much, uh, how much carbon are you talking about here? CO2, you're going to sequester something? What, what does that mean? Okay, one of the fascinating facts of what we're doing is there's almost no technology available out there that actually takes CO2 out of the sky and puts it back in the ground, sequesters it, gets it out of the greenhouse gas problem, right? In our process, when a, when a tree grows, photosynthesis is sucking up CO2. The carbon that that tree is made of comes out of the air, mostly. We think about plants as growing out of the soil. If you really think about it on a, on a molecular basis, a plant is mostly made out of air. It's made out of the carbon dioxide that it's taking in using the sunlight to build the, the other chemicals that it uses to build its structure. So all that carbon that's in there is coming out of the air. We take that wood and if we burned it to get heat, it would put all the CO2 back in the air, right? Pretty simple natural cycle. If we took that wood and let it rot on the ground, the microbes eat it, turn it into CO2, turn it into methane. Some of it will stay in the ground over a long period of time, but generally it's about a 10 to 20 year half-life. So every 10 or 20 years, half of that will be decayed and back in the sky. We take it and short circuit that process. We put it into our retort. We turn it into that recalcitrant form of carbon that does not break down so that we can put it back into the ground. Now that's only about half of the carbon that's in that wood that we're taking and doing that with. But over time, it builds up as we keep doing that. So it's the only technology that's available to turn the turn the CO2 problem around. And there's a whole bunch of other benefits too. If the, if the microbes are doing anaerobic digestion, they're producing methane. Methane's 26 times worse than carbon dioxide for a greenhouse gas. So we're avoiding that as well. I did some calculations the other day trying to figure out if we could actually put on our bag how much carbon you're sequestering by using our product. 
and I'm going to run this by a bunch of scientists and, and see if we can come to some conclusions. But in my early version, I estimated that every bag that we use and put in the ground is going to save about 15 pounds of CO2 equivalent. The way that happens is that what we're storing is the carbon portion of the CO2. And we're putting it in the ground so it's going to stay there. If you uh, make CO2 out of it, you've got to add the two oxygen molecules out of the air to do that. So the weight is much greater. So we're actually cutting it down, taking the most concentrated form, putting it in the soil, and then that soil now produces more plants. More plants are soaking up more CO2, however you look at it. It's a, it's a positive cycle instead of a negative one. And we're healing the ground instead of mining the ground for its nutrients. We're making it better and better and better. It also holds all those microbes. A huge amount of the carbon that's stored in the ground is in the form of microbiology, fungi, all of those things are big carbon stores. So we're promoting those carbon stores as well. Again, win, 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 win. How many wins can you get? It all sounds like snake oil when I say it like this, but it's, it's true. All those benefits are good. And they all come from doing this. Now there's another one. We're capturing the heat that's coming off of the process in order to heat things that we would normally be burning fossil fuels to, to heat. Now we've saved all that CO2. That didn't even fall into my, co into my, um, into my equations. You know, so there's an, a whole other benefit that we can put in there. One of the best parts of talking about this is talking to the college level kids and the high school level kids because they hear so often how things are getting bad, how we're not going to survive this, how the weather's going to change, we're all going to be underwater, um, everything's going to burn up, there's not going to be enough food, the diseases are going to take over. There's all this stuff on, on television or YouTube or wherever you want to go. It's doom and gloom. I love to talk about this because it's just one step in the direction of hope, in the direction of healing in the direction of wisdom, of how we can do things the right way, the first time. Music comes up, sunlight, you know. <laughs>